Um, I originally got into the business, um, I was an at-home dad, uh, taking care of two kids, a newborn and a one-year-old, um, uh, working on motorcycle stuff, so and selling a lot of motorcycle parts. I'd collected Moto Guzzi stuff for years and had an ad back in the days when we still had newspapers that had classifieds and had, a, had in the classifieds selling Moto Guzzi parts and Jimmy responded to it. And, um, that's how I originally met him. Uh, I started talking to him on the phone, ended up uh, coming out and getting his bike. He said he trekked it all the way up to Seattle to have it worked on. And so he had me come out and pick it up to do some work on it. And that's how I first met him. And, and just through talking with him and having his bike and everything, he started asking me to come out and do a little work at Willa Kinsey. Uh, special events, tasting, stuff like that. Came out, really enjoyed. Enjoyed the people and you know, everybody's drinking and having a good time and enjoying good food. And so, kind of one of those things that I really enjoyed it and it kind of woke me up to the whole new industry that I knew nothing about. Prior to that, had you had any um, experience with wine, or I mean, had you did you drink wine at all at that time, or uh, no? Uh, didn't drink wine at all. <laughs> so I, I'd never been much of a drinker. I don't drink beer. Uh, I never drank a lot of wine. Uh, tequila and mezcal were the choice for hard liquors, and just wasn't ever a whole big drinker. So when I got into the industry. Um, it was really through more of a passion for him. I really liked him as a person. Uh, he was a great boss. So I came out and continued working at Willa Kinsey. I uh, did harvest out there and then went over as his assistant to Mace Raw the next year. So it was kind of splash into the industry. Um, didn't really know a whole lot and then immediately into a position where I got to learn a lot of things from a really good person and that was that was key for me, you know, when you work with people all day long, every day, especially in an industry like this where a lot of times it's seven days a week for many, many hours, um, it's important that it's with somebody that you really, really enjoy spending the entire day with. So uh, as much as I enjoyed the industry, it was really who I was working with too that drew me into the industry. Well, and it seems a lot of people mention that Jimmy had sort of, you know, a, a magnetic quality he would build like sort of a community of, of people that, uh, that yeah. really that he knew everybody and that sort of thing. Yeah he was definitely extremely social you know I mean he graduated from Linfield so he spent a lot of time in this area in McMinnville area early on before he really started getting into wine so he had a good connection of people that he knew here before he got into the industry and then after he left and then came back here then his friends in the industry started to grow too so um, he was he was well liked, um, not by everyone, but he definitely, uh, for the most part, he just had a great personality to him. You know, he said what he thought, and everything was he was willing to learn and willing to willing to experience new things at all levels. So, you know, making wine takes a certain level of craftsmanship. You know, and a lot of people that get into it have. You know, sort of long-standing experience, or they have this, you know, bottle of wine. And they're like, "Wow, this is amazing! I want to learn how to do that." Um, how did you develop kind of that a level of craftsmanship to to be a, a winemaker, maybe not, you know, and not have had, having had that experience? Um, again, I think it goes back to a lot of everything I was learning was from Jimmy, so it was really about feeding off of his passion for what he was doing, since it was so new to me and I didn't have a lot of experience in it. Um, it, it was a great way to feed off and try new things. Uh, 98 Jacob Hart, uh, Rex Hill, that was the first wine to me that I tried that was like, wow, this is just a fantastic wine. Um, I had just started, you know, it was a year, year and a half into the industry for me and I, I didn't really have a lot of experience with a lot of different wines in the industry and that was the first one that really kind of spoke to me and said, you know, we could definitely make wines like this. So, um, what are some of the things that kind of you learned in kind of your apprenticeship with Jimmy that have stuck with you in terms of your style and your approach? Um, I would say a lot of it, you know, there's been a lot of change from what 
we were doing when I originally met him to the direction we were headed when he passed away into what we're trying to do now. Um, early on it was a lot of a lot of less intervention type of a approach in the vineyard but then more intervention type of approach in the winery where everything was a tool and we did a lot of different things. Um, once we started practicing biodynamics especially in what became our estate Riesling um, it just felt to me like we were going more in that direction eventually into the winery so after his passing in 04 I uh, moved more trying to go with an approach of very low intervention in the winery itself and bringing the whole biodynamic characteristic and, and into the winery so I, I think that was continuing on what I feel his thought process would have been. Do you feel kind of a kind of responsibility to kind of keep uh, his style around as part of the winery or? Um, no, I think, I, I think again, everything, my whole experience before all of this in the industry was with him. So he developed kind of my palette and my style um, for the most part so it, it it made sense to continue on in that same direction and I mean this is we're doing this again in his name so I mean this is this is his namesake and that's putting our own stamp on it but it's definitely all him still um, and why, why is that important why do you why do you want to keep that his name or it, involved in the whole operation? Uh, relationship. I mean, just because it was such a great relationship, he introduced me into all this. He kind of gave me that fresh start at that point in my life. It was later, uh, 29 years old. So, I mean, it, 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 I don't know, it's just something special, you know? I mean, it's something that has drawn his family in, um, as far as Janie and everyone else into it even further than they ever were before. And it's just uh, the relationship now is a lot to do with Janie. So her, her kind of continuation of, of Jimmy, more or less. So what was that transition like? So you're working um, you know, with Jimmy and uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, things change to the mix, or how did she approach things when, during that transition? Well, I think the biggest difference between Janie and Jimmy was Jimmy was always on the more artistic side, and Janie, I think, is more business-oriented, so her addition to the winery was huge in that kind of business background, um, and then her taking up of marketing and just you know, being on the uh, the IRF board, and I mean, she's just jumped completely into the industry way past just Brooks Winery. I mean, she's she's kind of taken it on on all levels, so I think that's something he would have really done, but I think she continued to bring that business end into it, which helped us to continue to grow. Did you um, see her much or know her at all before he passed Never away? met her. Really? Talked to her once on the phone. I remember answering the phone. I stayed with him for a while, and... Uh, answered the phone when she was on and gave it off to him, but no, I'd never met her before. So, um, were you at Maysera still at the time, working at Maysera at the time that yeah. he passed away? Yeah. So, we were still, still there doing a couple other people's wines too, um, so when when everybody pitched in, all the kind of base was from there, so I sent out all the tanks and the fruit from Esra and then brought everything back at the end and did all the blending and bottling there, so. That was when uh, the other folks were kind of making, pitching in to make the, the different wines? Yeah, yeah, when Jimmy first passed away, we had about 10 different wineries, all good friends of his, um, that all pitched in, made lots, um, up in Pinot and the Rieslings, um, Pinot Blancs, and kind of a little bit of everything and then I kind of told him how we'd been doing things, what direction we had been going in, gave him a tank and some fruit and then once everything was either done white wise I brought it back or done into a barrel we brought it back and did all the blending and everything and bottled the wines there that year. 
why do you think that everybody pulled together? I mean, they're, they're all competitors to a certain extent, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, Oregon has always been kind of, we talk about it being that special place where it is much more community-oriented, so um, it's, it's one of those things where we feel that if Oregon wine does well, then we all do well. So he, those were a lot of really good friends, really close friends to him um, that had a lot, a lot of respect for what he was doing with the label and everything. You still ride and did you do you build bikes too or? Yeah, uh, I do bike stuff and car stuff. I have a lot of different, like anything, but. Um, one of the guys working on this project just did a documentary on three different bike builders in Portland. Oh really? Thor, yeah. Drake, um, and two other guys, but just a 15 minute documentary, really nice piece though, and, huh. um, on custom bike building, and then uh, he works for an advertising agency and does their video and film work, so. That's cool. Uh, sort of a passion side project. Yeah. Um, do you still do kind of business on that side too, or is it uh, no. just you get to do it for fun now? Yeah, well, I don't even have time to do it a whole lot anymore. A lot of it's sat at the back. I finally drug one of the goosies back out. And took one over to my son's house. I want him to start writing. So he's going to kind of put things back together. We've got to put the light and stuff back on the front. And then the other one, I'm just kind of, it's been sitting at the back of the garage too, so I pulled it out, clean it up a little bit. I'm going to ride it for the next few months, hopefully. Jimmy is sort of a gearhead too, and a collector of odd vehicles. Yeah, he was he was more of a collector, riding wise and driving wise. He didn't work on a whole lot of anything, so just like the experience of being on the vehicles. So um, that you mentioned that folks had a lot of respect for what he was doing with the label and that sort of thing. What was um, unique about his approach? Why was he why was he different and kind of pioneering in terms of his style? Um, I think a lot of what his earliest pioneering thing was in in really trying to bring biodynamics into the into the vineyard business in Oregon. So I mean that was kind of a early on uh, starting at Mesera and getting the program there started in 01 and then starting our Riesling in 02. Uh, a lot of different groups that he had kind of got together, winemakers and, and vineyard people to start continuing it on and expanding it, growing it. I would say that was his, I think, his biggest contribution and then Riesling. So he had a, a really great passion for Riesling. Um, used to be very largely planted in Oregon, but for quite a few years they started tearing it out so there wasn't near as much old vine Riesling left and he just felt like old vine Riesling was you know it really adds a special character to the wine and uh, so he kind of kind of started with uh, Harry and, and Rollin and, and people like that to, to start looking at these old Riesling vineyards and actually starting to do work on them and really trying to uh, bring them into the condition that we want them to make the kind of wines that we want to make off of them. And, and that really wasn't a, an economic based decision, right? I mean, Riesling doesn't have yeah. the market power that. Yeah, Riesling have. is, you know, when you're farming a grape uh, at the same level that you're farming your Pinot at, um, it is a little bit more difficult because it's it's. You don't, you're not really hanging yield-wise any heavier than you are on the Pinot either. And so then your prices, though, are half of what they are for the Pinots. So it, it becomes more of a struggle and it's definitely something you do because you really, really like a particular varietal. And uh, we really, really like Riesling. So we've continued to try to and make that the, the large part of our Whites program and, and do as much different interesting things with it as we can. Um, and an interesting note, I've talked to winemakers kind of all over the West Coast and um, people in Arizona and Missouri and stuff too. And when people talk about a bottle that was really amazing, that really showed them the possibilities of wine before they were making wine, um, 
probably more than half, probably 70% of them said it was like an Alsatian Riesling. Mm -hmm. um, that style of Riesling was something that opened their eyes. And what, why do you think Riesling has that power to do that? Well, the, I think the, the best part about Riesling is the, the broad spectrum of ways that it can be made and styles that it can be made in. So really, on a level of a consumer, you, you can hit anybody's palate from very top of, or very bottom of dry to top of sweet. I mean, it really, it's, it's very universal in that sense. So to me, that makes it, it, it something that can appeal to anybody. It's just about finding what style it is that you like um, and what level of residual that you like and then going with um, areas that do that in particular really well. So an Alsace is definitely a drier style and uh, definitely a lot of winemakers will tend to lean towards a little bit drier style. Do you have a favorite varietal among the ones that you make? Or any, anything that's like near and dear to your heart? Um, Muscat. So I love Muscat. Uh, there's something about the aromatics on it um, that are very unique. They're very true. Um, they taste exactly like the grape taste, pulling it off the vine. And, and again, it's something that can be done in a lot of different levels too. So there's a lot of different variety of ways that you can make it. And, um, it's, it's just a really fun, fun grape. Do you have trouble finding muscat in this area? Or? Uh, there's a bit of it planted, not a ton of it, but there's not a lot of people making muscat, so uh, there, there's a few. Uh, and we just had a grower just down the hill from us plant me a half acre orange muscat, so that'll be something that'll be interesting to start to play with next year when it starts coming online. So um, how, how do you... How do you keep your kind of interest? Do you do a lot of experimentation in terms of, do you always have? Well, I made 23 different wines last year, so I, I, I keep my interest in just the, I think the amount of different things that I do. So that, that keeps me busy enough. I do experimentation all the time. I love to do barrel experimentation and try new things. And, but just, just the organization of making 23 different wines keeps me, keeps my interest. <laughs> How many, um, so how many full-time staff, is it just you on the winemaking side or you got No, winemaking, well full-time, Davin is, is my other full-time employee and he, he does tasting room and then helps in the winery. So it's, uh, there's not a lot of us and then during the summertime like now we have James come in and he'll help out and do stuff getting ready for bottling and everything. But, for most of the year, there's two of us here all the time. Uh, what What do you like about winemaking now after you've been in the industry for a while? What keeps you, going? you know, I like the same things I liked about it that kind of drew me into it. Just a lot of hands-on, um, a lot of trying new things, a, a variety of different things throughout the year. So, you know, you're never spending more than a couple of weeks or a couple of months doing one thing in particular, so it's always something new, always something exciting. Every year is new. Um, it's just a, it's a fun job, and I mean, what a great place to come to work. What, um, what are the hardest things about it? What's, what do you find most challenging? Uh, making thirteen thousand cases of a product that you really hope turns out as well as you want it to. So just the stress of making sure that things go the way you want them to. Um, you can do everything right and sometimes things go wrong and that's always a, always on the back of your mind. So it goes with the weather too. I mean, stressing out whether the grapes are gonna get to the level of ripeness that you want or too, too ripe in certain years. And um, so just the, the unpredictability of it and the stress that's created by it, but other than that, there's really no bad things about it. Um, what was uh, Jimmy kind of? Did, did he get stressed about things, or was he pretty easy going about it? He was so passionate about it, he probably had. To no, he, he he got pretty stressed about stuff. So, and he did a lot. You know, early on, he was doing 
a lot of vineyard and winery stuff too and when you're combining both of those together and spending all your time hoping and making sure that everything goes right it, there's just a level of stress that's created I'm, in, in my mind I'm probably one of the most easygoing people that you can possibly find in the industry but that doesn't mean that things don't stress you out I mean you still you're still making a lot of product uh, a lot of wine that is going to go and be sold somewhere and you want it to be representational of you and so you always put that that level of stress on yourself did you see any health kind of issues going on with jimmy or beforehand since you were working so closely for a lot of people it was just a complete shock no yeah. it was it was just a it was a birth defect, so it wasn't anything that you would have ever saw signs for. So that had to be just a, um, so it had to be to take you by surprise. Do you kind of recall kind of how you found out or how you heard about it or what was uh, I got a call from Tamina at Mesra. We were driving about halfway down to the coast on Labor Day weekend. So it was that Saturday. And, uh, just on our way down to the beach to hang out at the lake for a couple of days and got the call about halfway down and just kind of spent the rest of the weekend in shock. And then kind of after that event how did you how did you come to get involved with uh, the Brooks Winery? Well I mean just through helping with the label and kind of being the assistant for it for the first part and then discussing with Janie about kind of what she wanted to do and what her ideas were about the winery and it was always a big thing uh, that he was kind of making the winery for his son more or less I mean to continue on the Brooks name uh, kind of a legacy he considered it and uh, so we just decided that you know I mean it was working and it was it was doing good so why not just continue and see what happens so we, we I left Mesa that year um, and hired on full-time for Brooks and spent a couple of years in Custom Crush uh, then once we finally got production big enough to where we felt we could justify buying all the equipment to start a winery we got our winery and got our equipment and started doing it all uh, in-house why do you think it was, him, you know, he had talked about having that legacy um, for Pascal. Um, why did he, did he talk about that and why do you think that was important? Was that very much on his mind um, during the whole project or? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say it was at the front of his mind. Um, he had lost both his parents the previous couple of years before he passed away. Um, few years before he passed away so Janie was his only existing uh, sister and I just think it was something that he would just kind of kind of had that family connection to so it was really a big part of the part of the family for him and now Pascal is kind of involved in the winery on and off what have you seen do you kind of look for signs of him wanting to get more involved or uh uh, you know, I don't, I don't try to look towards that or think about that or try to put any sort of pressure on him about that. It's um, when he's here, I let him come up, I let him do some work, kind of show him what we do, what we spend our days doing, and you know, that's a decision that I want him to fully make on his own. So, you know, give him experience in it, like I had experience in it, and and Jimmy had experience in it and if it's something that he feels that he really is, has passion for and really loves and really wants to do um, I fully support and I'll, I'll teach him everything that he needs to know and and uh, let him do whatever he wants to do. Some of the other things um, so he had some strange marketing I guess decisions he has the Leon Trotsky uh, on the bottle and things like that that you're kind of continuing to do. Um, where do you think that sort of those sorts of ideas came from? Or? Um, that was just kind of something he wanted to do as a, a playful expression of I think a lot of the time that he spent before he came back to the States. 
So his, after he graduated from Linfield and started to uh, learn to make wine in Beaujolais, he started to travel about nine months a year over in Eastern Europe. And uh, a lot of, I think that label was kind of bringing that, his, his Polish background um, and his whole connection to that area that he felt um, that was just a good way to kind of express it and give it give it in a playful characteristic. In, in some ways he was sort of a, I guess, revolutionary figure in terms of bringing biodynamics and trying to bring more prominence to Riesling against the trends at the time that uh, might have gone to more mechanized or chemical farming or, um, you know, everything moving pretty dramatically towards Pinot Noir in the area, so to be have sort of like a revolutionary spirit or... Oh, definitely. I would definitely say he was he was always one to, to kind of push the envelope and, and, and do different things regardless of what he felt people's perception of him would be. So I guess in that sense he was a revolutionary. Do you have any um, anything that well, you mentioned the muscat. You know, is there is there something that you're really passionate about bringing to the industry or changing or? Um, um you know, for me, it's it's it sticks back to riesling. I mean, that's that's what I drink the majority of the time. That's what I spend most of my time thinking about. Um, made eight different Rieslings last year, so it's, uh, it's a big part of what we do, and I think that I hope to continue on that same um, spirit of, of Riesling that, uh, that everyone else was, that was trying to do before me, and, and I, I want that to be a big part of, uh, part of what people think of us when they think of us, as they think of good Riesling. Um, so, um what uh, advice might you have? A lot of people that we talked to came from, you know, they had this idea, oh, it'd be fun to, uh, you know, work in a beautiful spot and you know, be a nice lifestyle of making wine, and then they kind of are hit with the reality of it after they try and find out. Um, so do you, would you have any advice to the folks who are kind of in that spot, trying to figure out do they want to get into this or have that spark of an idea you know my my advice is is follow your passion I mean if that's what you want to do it's what you feel you really want to do then do it will it work out I mean there's no guarantees that anything will work out but I had no direction early on so I totally fell into the industry and you know consider myself one of the luckiest people in the world to actually have something like that happen I mean it, it just a lot of times through one phone call, it can change your life. And I mean, that's if that one phone call never happens, who knows what I'd be doing now. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you have the inclination of what you do want to do, follow it. That's what I lacked. I didn't, I didn't know. I just wasn't sure. Did you uh, uh, see yourself doing anything else or, or are you kind of in the wine industry to stay? No, I'm definitely in it to stay. I mean, I'll, I'll be at Brooks until I retire, so. After that, I'm traveling. Yeah, back on the road. Yeah, just you know, I want a, uh, I want a nice piece of property out in the middle of nowhere with a nice little cabin on it, something to come back to, and just spend, spend most of the year just traveling. I just want to go out and see sights and do all the things that I didn't necessarily do when I was younger. Oh, oh, that's kind of it'd be the opposite path of what Jimmy did. He did yeah. all of that stuff first. Yeah. Did, yeah. Were you inspired by the stories or tales of his? Oh, it was it was always great to listen to it. You know, and that's one of I think the luckiest things about his life is that he did get to experience so much before it was cut so short. So, um, if a lot of us died at the age that he died at, you know, we would have never saw uh, ninety-five percent of the things that he got to see. So. Um, some of us just get have the drive to do it early, and some of us have the drive to do it later. Well, great. That's my. Those are all of my questions.